headed up by a collaboration between uh, our national labor working group, the Democratic Socialist Labor Commission, and uh, the Green New Deal Campaign Committee. Um, and, you know, I'll talk a little bit about why those go together in just a moment, but I'm going to take a brief detour and just talk a little bit about labor history and why this is so important. Because I know, folks, we never learn about that stuff. And, you know, it has a lot to do with why we fight. So about 100 years ago in the, in the New Deal era, well, a little less though, right? Uh, after decades of, you know, protracted industrial struggles that sometimes broke out into open warfare, right? Like workers striking and fighting for their rights. Uh, the federal government enacted the National Labor Relations Act, which made unions legal for the first time in United States history. Before that, they were viewed basically as like mob, mafia, you know, organizations that were to be repressed at all costs. Uh, and, you know, wow, well, they still kind of are, but, you know, whatever. Um, and that was a result of a lot of work, uh, you know, of, of the then labor organizations, the Congress of Industrial Organizations, which is now part of the AFL-CIO, the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, was the more militant, uh, combative union federation that was built in a lot of ways by the left, by socialists by Socialist Party members, Socialist Party USA, Eugene Debs, yeah, uh, and by Communist Party cadre, uh, by, you know, the militant organized working class in this country who helped build these labor, you know, labor unions that were able to fight for the power to force the federal government to recognize them as legitimate organizations. So there's a lot more to be said about that, but just take it. Moving forward from there, Official labor union membership in this country skyrocketed over the decade after the National Labor Relations Act was passed, especially, I mean, private sector unions like my own, not, we're not talking about, you know, public unionism here, like city and employees and teachers and that kind of stuff yet, right? To the all-time high that it's ever been in the United States, it was something like 35% of all private sector workers in the United States were members of unions. And that power enabled them to help fight and win for reforms for the unions and for the working class more broadly. And then, uh, you know, as part of uh, the Red Scare, McCarthyism, anti-communism in this country, uh, you know, the capital class organized in order to get, you know, the United States government to change the laws and to take away many of the rights that unions had won under the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, and there's a lot of them, and there's a lot of good shit in there, right? And what the PRO Act does is essentially roll back many of these things to this earliest phase of legal unionism that allowed labor organizations to both exist legally and to be, you know, to uh, have employers be compelled to collectively bargain with them, but still enabled them to pursue militant action at the workplace, like strikes in solidarity with other workers, et cetera, that gave the muscle behind, you know, the sort of thinner legal framework that employers would like to divert all, all labor, you know, bargaining into, right? It does rescind right to work. That's one of the top line demands. Passing the Crow Act would make right to work illegal in the United States. That alone would, you know, honestly transform <clears throat> labor unions just as they exist currently without even really like changing that much else. I mean, I think about my union and how much of our resources, how much of our, and you know, there's somebody else on the call that could speak to that, but how much our organizers time is spent just trying to talk to our members and get them to keep paying dues so that they're still members of the union. So the union still has the resources to keep going. So this is really like a once in a lifetime potentially a chance. And it's a long shot to pass this bill. But Joe Biden has said that he will be the most pro-labor president in the history of the U.S., which, I mean, I think we can say is certainly bullshit. But that also is a pretty low bar. Um, so right now, the coalition led by IUPAT, of which DSA is now a member, is pursuing a plan uh, 
members of Congress are going to bring down, uh, or not bring down, bring up this res PRO Act resolution in the House in the next couple of weeks. They have a lot of co-sponsors already, which is great. The Democrats feel like they have to put their money where their mouth is for once and support our unions who always support them. Uh, I will say IUPAT has committed to zero out all political contributions to any union that does not, or to any uh, member of Congress that does not support this bill, which is a great first step in my opinion. And then the fight's gonna go to the Senate, which is gonna be a bigger uphill battle. Democrats have the majority, but it's thin, and there is the filibuster to deal with. So there's a lot of work to be done. And this looks like broadly a pressure campaign on members of Congress, flipping votes. And there's there's a couple different ways this is gonna look. One, and this is where the DSLC is gonna focus more, uh, is working with our members, DSA members who are members of unions, to work within their unions to build support in their locals for this. And the other is gonna be a sort of broader pressure campaign, uh, which is gonna look like a lot of things, but among a few things, a national level uh, dialer where we're going to get DSA members to volunteer to call people and talk to them about the PRO Act, uh, and potentially, you know, public and escalating action, whether like public rallies and maybe, you know, some more direct action type stuff, um, culminating uh, with, you know, what we're hoping to work towards, uh, some sort of day of action on May Day. Socialist Day, International Workers Day, May 1st, uh, which roughly coincides with the end of Biden's first 100 days in office uh, to, you know, bring up the public eye to this and to basically say, like, you know, tell the Democrats to shit or get off the pot. Um, because it's long past due, you know. Obama administration had the triple crown and had the chance to pass the Employee Free Choice Act, which, is, which was a good pro-labor legislation, and they threw it away and never did anything when they had the chance. So we're asking that they, they come back and do that. And so I'm going to make a final point, and then I'm going to pass it off to Paul, who's going to talk about the next steps for this. Um, where the Green New Deal campaign comes into this. I mean, it's really based on you know our theory of change as socialists, which is that in order to win these transformational reforms to our society, like a Green New Deal and all the things that that might entail, the federal jobs guarantee, you know, getting off of carbon completely, uh, and basically, you know, the transference of our entire energy system from the sector of private profit, profiteering to a democratically controlled public good that is available as a right to everybody. Like those things are never won by politicians. Uh, or elites who, you know, kindly give us the things that we want. Like the things like that are and always have been and only are ever won by mass struggle, right, from below by organized working class people fighting for these things. And from the perspective of the Green New Deal campaign and this, you know, sort of broad socialist theory of change, if we hope to win the Green New Deal, the only way that we're ever going to do it is if the labor movement is stronger than it is right now. We are at a, an historic low of, of labor unionism in this country. And we need a minute, we need, we are we not, we need, we need more than a minute, but we have to use this moment to try to turn that around. And it is our job as socialists to help rebuild the labor movement and to talk to organized workers about why this struggle is important. Uh, because, you know, it impacts my trade, um, you know, IBEW members do a lot of things that have to do with fossil fuels or, you know, other less great, you know, energy sectors. And because we're at the whim of the market and something like a Green New Deal would provide the opportunity that would cut through like Republican, Democrat political, you know, distinctions for workers in, in electrical field and many other fields to, to, to have new jobs that are actually working for the good of, you know, our class more broadly and our society more broadly. Um, so yeah, I think that I've said plenty, um, and I'd like to pass it off to Paul Steiner, who's, uh, also a member of IBW 520 to talk about the labor meeting and what the next steps are for Austin DSA in this campaign. Thanks.
Oh, Paul, are you there? <laughs> All right. Can people hear me? There we go. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, I'm Paul Steiner. Uh, like Dave said, he, him. Uh, I'm a rank and file member of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers as well. Uh, like Dave said, the NPC made the PRO Act a national priority, but just making something a, a priority or passing a resolution doesn't the campaign make, right? That's why we're going to be talking about next steps at the Labor Branch meeting on Thursday at 7 p.m. You can find the RSVP link uh, in the agenda for tonight's meeting. Uh, I won't lie to you, the PRO Act is kind of a moonshot. Uh, it'll require significant pressure on a lot of very bad senators, both Democrat and Republican, uh, to pass. And it will obviously face opposition in the court system that is just packed with Republicans now. But the good news is, is that these are all liberal cases for inaction, right? As socialists, getting, the, getting something passed is only half the battle. A campaign is only a socialist campaign if by the end, the working class is more organized than when the campaign started. That's why half of the battle for us is pass of passing the PRO Act is getting a grip on what the labor movement is like here in Austin. My union, IBEW Local 520, has already signed on as a result of DSA member rank and filers within the union. But this union is going to need allies, state, county, and municipal employees, plumbers, teachers, everybody. So the first step is doing some power mapping of the local labor movement, phone banking Austin DSA members uh, to take a labor census, figure out where we have members and where we can like, you know, actually throw our weight around in what unions. Uh, so if you're interested in helping us do that, uh, if you have the skills for that, or even if you don't, uh, or are even just interested about in hearing about what's going on within the labor movement in Austin at large. Uh, for example, you know, we have the Emergency Workers Organizing Committee and uh, the Restaurant Organizing Project who uh, will also be there to give reports. So, uh, you know, if you are interested in helping to pass the PRO Act, uh, show up to the labor branch meeting this Thursday at 7 p.m. Uh, once again, the RSVP link is in the agenda that uh, Leah linked uh, in the beginning. Uh, thanks, y'all, and solidarity. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. OK, next up, we have Sarah and Jordan. For Sarah, talking about electoral committee work. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Swallow. And yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about things that we've been doing with our electoral committee. But more broadly, we have uh, a DSA statewide group that has been meeting for the past few months that has a few dozen members from Austin DSA, Houston, North Texas, and San Antonio. And that got together a few months ago to focus on what type or to talk basically a talk about what type of work can we do at the Texas legislature statewide in coordination with different chapters and also what type of electoral work can we do statewide. Um, so this is kind of like a working group so far, but we have launched some projects I'm going to tell you all about. And so like Leah was saying earlier, you know, we just went through this horrible week um, where the energy systems that we have totally failed us because they're capitalist. And in general, the Texas leadership is to blame. Um, and I'm not saying the Democrats would have done a perfect job either, but it's the people who run the state, mostly Republicans who, you know, led that deregulation. And it's a lot, you know, it's a, because of them. It, I mean, these are decisions that were made at the state level, right? Like this wasn't a Donald Trump thing. And so, and like Leah said, we don't have any DSA members in the Texas legislature. There's no AOC in the Texas ledge. <clears throat> the most progressive ones are probably Gina Inahosa from Austin or maybe Aaron Zwiener out in Hayes County or Ana Maria Ramos. I mean, there's a, a handful that are like fairly progressive, but there's no, no one who's anything close to a socialist in the Texas ledge at this point. So we really need to increase our participation in the Texas legislature as socialists, understanding that it's a very imperfect body and it can be very hard to get things done. Um, and I'm curious how many people on this call have done any advocacy work at the Texas Ledge. If you have, if you've ever you know, had a day job where you advocate at the Texas Ledge, or if you've done some in your free time, um, please just like comment 
um, raise your hand or comment in the comment section and say if you if you're someone who has done work at the Texas Ledge because I, I know we have some and I would count myself in that I work for a labor union, the Texas State Employees Union, where I'm the legislative aide. Oh, awesome. We have a couple people who work at the ledge. But I'd say for most of us, we, we haven't had that experience. Um, have any of y'all ever watched a committee hearing at the Texas ledge? Or have any of y'all watched the Texas House or the Texas Senate deliberating on anything? If you have, go ahead and raise your hand. Use a little raise hand function so we can see how many people have you know, watch stuff at the Texas Ledge. Okay, good. We definitely have probably at least a dozen or maybe a couple, a few dozen that are raising their hands. So that's good. So what we're going to do this year is build on that a lot and get even more DSA members to have a good grounding in what is the Texas Legislature and what does it do. Um, last legislative session, we didn't do any formal work at the Texas Ledge. Uh, some DSA members were a part of it in some way or another, but we didn't do anything through DSA. And so this year we are going to do some pressure campaigns through DSA. Um, and keeping in mind that the Texas legislature is only in session for about five months every other year. So it was in session from January through May of 2019. And then they go away for about a year and a half and now they're back and it'll be over on May 31st. So, and you know, about three months, it'll already be over. It's a very short time frame, But with such limited time, probably the most efficient thing that we've come up that, with that we can do is launching a few pressure campaigns on the Texas legislature that are based on legislation that has already been filed. In a perfect world, maybe next legislative session in 2023, DSA can help craft legislation that is actually more, you know, revolutionary, that would actually be more socialist and we can get legislators to carry the bills for us and have like a stronger hand. At this point, the best that we can do is just find some legislation that would be good for uh, harm reduction and do some incremental change to make some things better in Texas and get behind them and push legislate, legislators to vote for them. So let me see. So we've come up with a few campaigns so far that uh, we think a lot of us have shown interest in, at least those that have come to the DSA statewide meetings. And those include full legalization of marijuana, as that, since that is a criminal justice issue and a racial justice issue, and also, uh, you know, good for the economy and also, you know, would just be nice to have legal weed. And it's also a healthcare issue because we have so little, we don't even have very much medicinal marijuana in Texas. So cannabis legalization, also Medicaid expansion is a big one. It is very different from Medicare for all. This is, we're not talking a single payer program. We're talking about Medicaid, which is already pretty small in Texas and making it bigger according to the Affordable Care Act because Texas did not accept the help from the Affordable Care Act several years ago. So just expanding Medicaid a little bit to cover another one or two million adults, that would still be very good for harm reduction and good for the healthcare system in general. And it also doesn't cost very much. Um, a $15 minimum wage. We're not sure if that will go very far at the federal level. If it looks like the federal government's going to pass it, then we don't need to, you know, mess with that in Texas. And then we've also talked about the George Floyd Act, which is a criminal justice reform package and potentially something on eco-socialism or obviously energy and the electric grid after what happened last week. Um, so those are some of the issues that we've been looking at. And so far, can, uh, legal cannabis and Medicaid expansion are the two that we've gotten the furthest with in terms of launching a campaign, a pressure campaign. And now what does a, what does a pressure campaign look like at the Texas Ledge? Well, it could look like a whole lot of things, right? And if we had started earlier or if we had more groundwork to start from, uh, we could have done you know, a much bigger campaign. At this point, uh, we're gonna do ca campaigns that start with an Action Network page. So if any of y'all have done Action Network before, you know what I'm talking about. If not, I'll put an example in the chat in a little bit or maybe someone else from Texas State Employees Union could drop an example in the chat. 
of an Action Network campaign. But basically what you can do with Action Network is you create like a web page where any person can go in and send a letter to their state representative and their state senator just by clicking a few buttons. You type in your name, your address, and it'll look up who your state senator and state rep are. And then you just click send and it sends the email or you can customize the email, but it's literally something that takes about 30 seconds. So Amanda just dropped one in the chat. I'd encourage a whole bunch of people to go and fill that out in thir for 30 seconds or open it and fill it out later because Texas state employees need a raise and we're sending hundreds and thousands of emails to state representatives telling them to pass a pay raise for state employees, but that's a separate thing. Um, so, so can you, yes. uh, sorry, we're starting to run over time, so. Yes, let me wrap it up, sorry. Um, so that's essentially what we're doing is we're starting these campaigns with Action Network uh, landing pages, and we've all, almost already finished one for Medicaid expansion and cannabis legalization. So you should be seeing those soon. Um, and we'll definitely be asking everyone to fill it out and to pass it around to a lot of people. Okay, so the asks for what we need are more people to help us launch these campaigns. So I found some leaders that want to help with Medicaid expansion and legalizing cannabis, but honestly, we need more people because I'd like for this to be bigger than just our email cannon, because that's essentially what Action Network is. It's just like a big email cannon towards the state legislature. But I'd like to, you know, grow this more, but understanding that we only have a couple months to do so. So there is a link in the agenda um, where it says sign up to help out. Please fill that out if you would like to be connected with the people that are working on these issues. Um, and there's also a meeting this Thursday, that's the DSA statewide group. So come to that meeting if you can, if you'd like to hear more about what we're doing at the Texas Ledge. And so basically uh, where we're going is that hopefully in a couple years, we'll have a whole lot more DSA members who know a whole lot more about the Texas Ledge. And, um, and then we'll be in a place where we can run a lot of candidates for the Texas Ledge. But we're not gonna start running a lot of candidates for Texas Ledge and being successful if our membership doesn't have you know, a good baseline understanding of how the Texas Ledge works. So this is like, a big part of this is just like an educational campaign to help us all as DSA members deepen our understanding of the Texas Ledge. Okay, and I could go on, but I think, uh, Leah, did I cover everything? And yeah, I you're good, you're good. Um, Thank you, Sarah. So um, real, very quick, Jordan, it's gonna take one minute to talk about the Electoral Committee coming up. All right, um, hello everyone. Uh, Jordan Stewart, he, him, I'm the new Electoral Coordinator on the uh, Leadership Committee uh, for our chapter. Uh, so uh, last night we decided uh, in a meeting to have our first Electoral Group, uh, com Electoral Committee meeting on March 11th at 7 p.m. It's a Thursday. It uh, doesn't conflict with anything on the calendar that I could see. So hopefully if you are interested in joining and organizing with us, uh, we're going to be in the near term focusing on helping out with the uh, our issue uh, stances on the bond election, the Austin uh, propositions. In the midterm, we're going to be also focusing on the state ledge pressure campaigns, as well as beginning to do research on candidates and districts uh, and demographics and everything in the uh, in our in our area. Finally, in the long term, we're going to be identifying candidates and uh, hopefully running them in primaries to have socialists. Uh, we're going to also craft an endorsement process uh, over the next uh, few months or a year, uh, probably a few months. Uh, and we're going to be doing that with the leadership committee uh, in tandem with them. So anyway, I'm going to drop a link in the chat. Uh, we this meeting is fresh, so it didn't make it into the agenda, I think maybe, but uh, that's uh, that's the action network for that. So just RSVP, uh, March 11th, Thursday, 11 p.m. And also don't forget uh, Thursday, the state uh, statewide uh, coordination meeting as well uh, this Thursday. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Um, okay, so next is the third thing I said that we we're going to talk about, which is the defund and decrim campaign. Nicole, I think, is speaking. Hey, guys. Uh, Nicole Maddox, she, her. Uh, actually, I was just thinking back and realizing so much has happened since last GBM that has gotten this kicked off. Um, we've gone through two different city council elections to get hotels purchased to provide long-term assistive housing to the homeless. Um, but on the same day as that second election uh, is when Save Austin Now's petition 
to recriminalize uh, camping for the homeless. Uh, unfortunately was certified. And of course, after some um, review uh, for the ballot language, it's been added, that is Prop 2. Um, and so we are going to be fighting the fuck out of that. Um, so we have started a committee and this is this the DSA committee for this is also uh, sort of in coalition with a variety, a large number of groups. We've got home, uh, Homestock Handcuffs, Austin is Safe for Win, Grassroots Law, I don't know that I can even think of the whole list. Um, tons of people that are all aligned on this. We have, um, it's a Saturday election, Saturday, May 1st. So that um, kind of works out in our benefit. We can hopefully drive up a bit more uh, voter turnout. Um, we have lots of campaign stuff going forward. And in the agenda link, you'll see a link to the link tree for it. Um, on that link tree, we're gonna keep kind of one to two weeks worth of, of events up there. So you guys can RSVP. Uh, for instance, coming up on Friday, we're gonna have an, uh, a text and train event. So we're gonna get people trained up on how to text bank. That's Friday at 6.30. Uh, the big kickoff, so the whole big kickoff uh, campaign event is Saturday uh, at 2 p.m. this Saturday, February 27th. It's gonna be a phone bank followed by a barnstorm. And we're going to use that barnstorm to, to kind of round up additional phone bankers. Hey, did you just have fun? Let's do this again. Um, and then we're gonna have another phone bank on Sunday at 2 p.m., which will lead into our committee meeting, which of course you guys can also attend. Um, we'll need to get that added to the link tree. Um, that's at 4.30, so. Um, there's the link tree also has uh, links for you to contribute to Austin DSA's pack, so you can help fund this effort. Um, we're of course using Reach, and we'll be getting some door knockers uh, designed and out there. We're going to do a limited uh, door knocking campaign where we just go around, you know, get stuff hung on on stuff that's close to where you live, um, likely voters. Uh, we also need to make sure we're getting everybody registered to vote. So a lot of our uh, phone and text banking efforts are going to be confirming, hey, are you registered to vote? Do you need to make any changes before that deadline? Um, there are volunteer deputy registrar training opportunities available where you can sign up to uh, register people to vote. And there are provisions on how to register the homeless to vote. Um, there are There is a, a process by which you can do that. So we, if we can get more people trained up on that and then go mobilize the homeless communities to turn out as well. I mean, who else is this going to affect the most? So um, we had a recent meeting with the national DSA uh, endorsement campaign and kind of walked them through the issues. Uh, huge props to Seneca because he knows the going back history of this for years. Um, this all started, of course, when they decriminalized homeless camping back in 2019, and that was a huge DSA effort um, as well. So that is uh, that call went very well. It sounds like they are on. They don't see really any uh, um, obstacles to that coming down the chain, and so we're hoping to, because of the schedule and how people have to vote on it, we're hoping to see that national level, national level endorsement uh, by mid to late March. Um, again, so the big asks on this one are to sign up for our events coming up this weekend. That's the big push to get everything kicked off. And let's uh, pummel Save Austin now into the ground. Um, I'm seeing some shirts, uh, ideas for shirts and t-shirt cannons, and I'm all down for that. Um, especially if we can shoot them at his house. So, and that's all I got. Awesome, thanks, Nicole. All right, last one of the four that I mentioned is um, Sarah is gonna be talking about the membership committee. Hi all, I'm Sarah, she, her. I'm the membership engagement coordinator. This committee is brand new, um, but it's been a busy month because of the snowpocalypse. Last week, we set up phone banks and text banks to try and um, contact all of our members and check in on them. We started with a phone bank on the fly and I think we called about 350 of our newest members. Um, and then later that week, we um, did a text bank to um, for the entire membership to let them know about, to let y'all know about this meeting and also to check in. 
Um, I just want to shout out the people who help make phone calls. So Andrew, Nathan, Alexa, Crystal, Sam, Aaron, Don, Chris, Jason. Sorry if I missed anyone, but um, all these folks are making calls on like the worst days of the snowstorm um, and providing real assistance to people. Um, we'd have people ask for stuff like, you know, I have no power or food right now. And then we'd find someone else to walk the food over to them. So it was really rad. We also got a lot of use out of our neighborhood groups since traveling was an issue and you can only get assistance from people within walking distance in a lot of cases. If you're not familiar with the neighborhood groups, um, they're fairly new and it's a series of what, what app groups, about 10 of them that split the city up into 10 groups. So you can join the group that's closest to your neighborhood. Um, it's all DSA members and the link is in the agenda. I'm gonna paste the agenda too, again. Um, but since this committee is new, um, we have the opportunity to really imagine what we want for it and plan our future. Our first meeting's tomorrow, and I plan to use that time for us to discuss our goals for the future of this committee. Unfortunately, it's at the same time, it overlaps a little bit with Red Square because a lot of things had to get rescheduled because of last week. Um, but please show up and share your ideas and help us out. Some things that we've talked about so far that people want to do um, or create better onboarding materials like automatic onboarding on Slack, which we, which Mad, Maddie set up recently. Um, stuff like new member orientation um, programs, more social events, and better internal organizing to grow our member to member relationships. Um, we're also working on doing more um, improving our membership contacts so that we have a standardized way of doing it. So you don't have to be like in the know for your campaign or committee to be able to contact membership. Um, Right now we're working on doing stuff like helping contacts for defund the CRIM and the labor census that Paul mentioned earlier. Um, but yeah, so show up tomorrow if you want to help contribute. Wonderful.